they had an encounter. They had had this encounter with Jesus that had changed absolutely everything. And pretty quickly, they realized that it wasn't just each of them that were having the encounter, that there were these others all around them that had been having the same encounter. They, too, have found healing. They, too, had found restoration. They, too, had found new life. They, too, had found forgiveness and reconciliation. They, too, had found liberation. And so, the, this group of people that had had this encounter with Jesus were drawn to one another, to life together. And that life together, as, as the text tells us today, was quite a, a beautiful kind of life. Now, I do recognize that anytime we're telling these kinds of stories together, these stories are, are, are idyllic. It's beautiful, perfect, amazing. As an idealist myself, I will also acknowledge that I also recognize that we know for a fact that it wasn't so idyllic. I mean, where two or three are gathered together, there's ten opinions, five disagreements. But there's something about this picture that we shouldn't just ignore. The beauty of this community of people. These folks have been called out for the purposes of being a light to the nations. This community that had had such a powerful encounter with Jesus that he changed absolutely everything. And there's some practices within this text that I want us to explore together just for a few moments. And the first one is something that we might take for granted in the church because we kind of do it automatically. They gathered around the teaching and fellowship of the disciples. So these, these folk in this early Christian community gathered around the, the, the learning and the fellowship of the good news of Jesus Christ. In the early Christian community, the, the, the early stories of Jesus were called the memoirs of the apostles. So they gathered around the apostles' teaching and fellowship. That meant that they gathered around the, the base stories of Jesus. So they rehearsed them together over and over again about Jesus' healing and his reconciliation and his forgiveness and his new life. They, they were constantly reminded of the, of the power of, of the Jesus story, of his sacrificial love for the world, uh, uh, upon, upon the ways in which he, he also subverted authority and the powerful. And, and so they gathered around and they kept on learning together what that meant for them, and they fellowshiped around that narrative of the gospel. And 2,000 years later, we, here we are, sitting in Lincoln, Nebraska, gathered around the basic teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. And we need it, because humans easily forget. And so we rehearse it week after week, month after month, year after year, we committed to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then they did something else, too, which grabs my imagination. If you notice towards the tail end of the text, this community decided that they were going to gather around two, two movements that were connected to one another. They cared for one another, and they cared for the world. And so a, a Christian community at its core is a community that is committed to caring for one another. And I hope you do. Uh, in fact, there's some natural ways in which we care for one another today. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, after worship today, you'll have an opportunity to, to go by the social hall and have cookies and coffee and catch up. That's a way that we care for one another. And on an average week, you might, you might find us here praying for one another. And, and we, get, we get reports from the community about those who are sick or, or struggling. And we gather around them with support and love. And, and, and that's beautiful and amazing. And we should do that. I hope you have an opportunity around your pew to, to catch up with each other. 
But a community that just does that, that's just, just not enough. And way too many churches become so self-centered that way. Because the second movement is, in light of their caring for one another, then they care for the world in a very similar way. They extended the ministry of care. They extended the ministry of love. They extended the ministry of reconciliation. They extended the ministry of, of catching up with one another and, and, and gathering around one another and eating together. And so, so they went beyond the walls of their gathering. And then they extended that kind of care and hospitality and love to a world. And did you notice that they care so deeply and so powerfully in those ways? that they had the goodwill of their neighbors. And so, people of God, I'm wondering how we might together on this day practice this ancient pattern together, gathering and learning and fellowshipping around the good news of Jesus, caring for each other deeply, and extending that care for the neighbor. I have a hunch that if we do this in 2024, the Lord will add to our number those who are being saved. Last night was our confirmation service, and JC and me were teaching them about the church, and I did this with them. I want to do it with you. Hold your left palm open, and imagine in that hand all of the loss that there has been in your life, loved ones who have died, the struggles you've had. Imagine in that hand all the times life has been hard. You're not sure you measured up the mistakes you made. Hold that. Now open your other hand. And think of this beautiful morning the moments in life you've experienced some awe at the beauty of life. Imagine some gratitude for the gift of life itself. Now, my friends, bring those together and clasp your hand and give thanks because everything that you are is because of those struggles and because of that gratitude. Everything that you have become. And know this God loves everything you are beyond your wildest imagination. Do you hear the birds? It is such a beautiful description of the early church. It's lyrical, lush in how beautiful those first believers were in their faith and in their love for one another. And as I'm reading Acts chapter 2 and I'm swept up into the gorgeousness of the passage, I have to admit the last sentence lands with a thud. It sounds clunky to me. They were adding to their number those who were being saved. You see, I have to tell you that I think American religion has ruined that word. I really do. Because now we use that word to, to, to think that if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. And so you better be saved in this punitive message. And, and it turns all of the beauty of Christianity into a reward and punishment scheme. You're either going down or you're going up, and you better be saved. And it just sounds like an ornery word to me now. It ruins the poetry of the passage. Some years ago, a friend of mine invited me to go with him to his charismatic church. Do you know what a charismatic church is? That's not using the English word like magnetic or compelling in that way. Charismatic comes from the Greek word charism, which means gift from the divine. So a charismatic church believes they might 
might receive gifts from the Holy Spirit at any moment, like even during worship. So we went to this charismatic church, and, and all of a sudden during the worship, people were standing up and swaying, and some began to speak in tongues, that mystical, spiritual, ancient language, and, and some people were falling to the ground and, and sort of swimming around, and it all seemed so strange, but also oddly familiar. It was just like being in a mosh pit for the Red Hot Chili Peppers in the early 1990s in Southern California. If you know, you know. <laughs> and, and after that worship, we got in the car and he turned to me and he said, are you saved? And it, it felt like a strange question to me. It, the syntax is off. Are you saved? In English, you'd say, have you been saved from something, I suppose, but the syntax seems strange. It also seemed a little oppositional to me, like you better be or I am and you're not or something. It just felt, felt ornery to me. But he was my friend and I, I didn't have much of a response. I said, I, well, I hope so. <laughs> but I think American religion has ruined that word saved. And so let me explain to you a moment about the Greek word that's there. Remember, our Bible is written, our New Testament's written in Greek. The word saved is an English word we just put in there. That's not the word in that passage. Let me tell you what word it is. It's sozo, S-O-Z-O, sozo. And sozo is a wonderfully nuanced word. Sozo in the Greek means you're safe. You're secure. Sozo in the Greek means you, you've been healed. And, and it's all right now. Sozo in the Greek means a sense of completeness or fullness. Oh, in the Greek it keeps the beauty and the poetry of this whole passage. For they are experiencing in Jesus Christ being made complete and flourishing. And they feel now safe and it's so beautiful. Sozo, this is sozo. Everything they are. Everything they will be safe in Christ's love, sozo. Put your hands together again. Everything you are, everything you will be safe in Christ.